Hey, welcome everyone. Welcome to another week with Live with Charlie. I'm your host for the day, Larry Bailey. Today is May 24th. Um, we're going to go ahead and admit a whole bunch of folks in here. Uh, every week we meet on uh, Tuesdays at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 1.30 p.m. Pacific, and we go over industry information, market updates, uh, questions and answers. Uh, sometimes we've got specific topics, but today, uh, the episode today is all going to be about some general guidelines and a question and answer session, uh, if you have anything for us to talk about. So uh, before we get going, if, if uh, you have any questions uh, during the event today, go ahead and either take yourself off mute and go ahead and ask away. And if you are, uh, or if you would rather just go ahead and, and chat your question, you can certainly use the chat feature within the meeting. Uh, for those that are listening out on the replay, um, there is an easy way to join the event every Tuesday, and that's to get over to the Ridge Lending Group community. Go into events and uh, go ahead and register for that, that uh, RSVP for that weekly event. And you'll be sent a uh, given access to a Zoom link, and that link will get you right in, uh, and you can go from there. So for, uh, for those that are on, if, uh, if you have any questions, let me know. I thought it might be I thought it might be healthy um, to talk about uh, a little bit about interest rates and market conditions today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share screen. If I could figure this out, we're going to go ahead and share, 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 share. Uh, I have to figure out the right. <laughs> I have to figure out the correct. Uh, browser to share and let's see share screen and we're going to share the uh, let's get the right one here show all windows there are so many windows to share on my computer and I am sorry for making you wait but we're going to go through uh, market conditions today and rates and that kind of a thing uh, let's go ahead and admit that and I must have missed the window to share. Let's go ahead and I guess we're going to do this one morning update. There we go. Now I figured it out. All right. So uh, for those that are just joining again, we're, we're going to go have this more of an open uh, session. Uh, I wanted to uh, kind of start us off with um, every now and then I'll post a, uh, a market update. Uh, MBS Highway is a uh, if you, ever, if you follow along with like, I don't know what stations he's on anymore, but like CNBC used to visit and some of the other market, um, the daily market uh, updates, like maybe MSNBC. And um, if I have those wrong, I'm sorry, but Barry Habib is the guy who created MBS Highway. And he's just got his, his kind of finger on the pulse of what's happening. So I know I've shared this with, in previous meetings and I thought it'd be healthy um, to go ahead and share and uh, do me a favor for those that are on the call. I just want to make sure because Zoom has a horrible interface here. You guys seeing the um, the website for MBS Highway? Uh, I would love to to make sure you can see it. Okay, give me a thumbs up or give me a yes so you can see it kind of a thing. Um, that would be great. Before I go on, it says I'm screen sharing, so I'll go ahead and take that as a yes. Uh, in any event, this is where we've been. <clears throat> pardon me. So this back here was on, on May 4th. And we've been kind of at this bottom um, to get technical. Um, this is kind of a, a floor resistance. So we, we saw that um, the cost of money gets more expensive, the lower this graph goes, the cost of money gets less expensive, the higher the graph goes. And so what we what we saw back on May 9th, um, we saw a little bit of a head fake on May 10th and 11th. And it's been kind of teetering between this range back and forth, back and forth. And then back on May 18th, so last week, we ended up getting some decent news. And the decent news was, if you if you paid attention to this stuff, is maybe inflation is at its max. Maybe it's at its max. Um, it certainly uh, started to talk about with the Federal Reserve chairs, um, talking about how maybe they didn't need to do three rate increases this year. Maybe it's only going to be two. Um, the uh, the act of of um, of uh, raising rates right at the Federal Reserve to 
cause uh, the consumer to maybe stop spending so hot uh, is, its, is its guide here. Um, and, and what we're starting to see now, if we, if we look in this range here, are uh, slight improvements. Doesn't mean that this translates into dollars and cents on our, on our mortgage rates. It just means that there's um, a stop of this just free fall, what we saw <clears throat> back um, earlier this year. Now this is back on March 2nd, and now we're on May 24th. And so this angle of, of increasing of cost of money kind of flattens out and maybe now it kind of leads itself up a little bit, which means um, rates kind of stop going up so hard and fast. We'll see where this goes, right? We don't really know. And what was important, uh, I didn't post this out today just because I try not to, uh, let me go ahead and get you over here. So what was, what was the, the news of course, was the, the new home sales. So if you didn't get this news, I didn't post it. So you might not have seen it, but the market was expecting about a change of, of negative 2% and it came in at negative 16%. And this is year over year change new home sales. And of course, this is what's reported from uh, National Association of Realtors. So the, um, you know, this doesn't necessarily reflect everyone's truth, but it reflects, um, the most available information possible. And, and what's interesting about um, this graph is, um, you know, again, year over year, a 16, uh, sorry, a 27% fall year over year, maybe seems like a lot, a negative 16%, maybe over month over month, maybe seems like even a bigger deal. What's really important here, necessary, what the, I want to pay attention to is new home sales, Guys, if you're looking for um, possible deals, you know I know that there's a bunch of folks um, I've been talking to recently that are looking out Midwest um, because there's some value plays and there's some cash flow plays there. The South, uh, I, again, I live in New Jersey. I've got family in Florida and I've talked to a bunch of people who are trying to find property in Florida as an example. Uh, it's tough. Um, and you can see 307,000 sales reported in the month of April. Um, it's hot, you know, 163 out West. So, um, you know, this might be impactful for you if you're looking for where to go. If you're dead set of buying properties in the South and the West, you might have higher competition um, than if you're looking in Northeast or Midwest. Uh, you know, Northeast, usually pretty expensive. Midwest, maybe not so much. Uh, but I've, I've been talking to some folks that are looking out Midwest for opportunities. So um, that might be important for you. The, uh, the long-term look here though, for the, uh, for this, for this week, in terms of um, uh, events that are happening, um, I actually have to look, but here's where I was, I was kind of telling you, don't do that. Uh, you don't want to hear Barry talk. So the, uh, you know, the Fed set the hike, here next month, about three weeks from now, 50 basis points, and then maybe also in July, but we'll see. And so um, if, as more information comes out relative to employment, relative to income, relative to spending, uh, this is going to give us some real-time information for the Federal Reserve to decide what we're doing uh, with longer-term rates, um, excuse me, with shorter-term rates, which are going to impact, of course, longer-term rates. So. Any questions before I leave this part? Does anybody have any questions about um, interest rates, how they work uh, in terms of what these uh, charts really mean or anything along those lines? You can either take yourself off mute or you can um, give me a chat and watch the chat window over here. Okay. Um, so the the, uh, the next part of the, the next segment really of, of today's episode is I wanted to get into um, the mechanics of making sure you've got a, um, uh, a handle on what your available programs are. I think last show and certainly the one before that, uh, so, so over the last couple of shows, I've been talking a lot about loan programs and, and what's possible and, and what's available. So um, before I go into uh, you know, some of the basics, I thought it might be a good idea to come back to some of the basics. 
uh, for that qualifying. Um, does anybody have any questions about a uh, scenario they have or a loan situation they have or, uh, or, a, um, uh, or something that happened to them recently, whether it was with Ridge Lending or another lender that you want to talk about more relative to mortgage or the experience of mortgage, things like that? So when we, uh, if you have any questions, let me know. And um, what I thought it might be important to talk about here is the uh, the idea of uh, loan to value um, for multiple, you know, for multi units and qualifying off of that uh, income off the property uh, if you've got multi unit. So a uh, naturally, when you have um, a single family home. You're, you're allowed to have um, as little down as 15%, depending on the loan program. Um, when you get into two to four units, for especially for an investment property, um, your LTVs are going to be cut down to as much as, or as, you know, you're going to have to put sometimes as much as 25% down, um, possibly more, depending on the loan program that you're using and your credit score, things like that. And, and I want to talk about um, that LTV mark and the source of funds and um, ultimately the cash flow that you can use from that multi-unit. As a reminder, uh, this came up a couple times this week, actually, but as a reminder, if your occupancy is investor, so if you are not going to live there as your primary or second home, you need to have those funds sourced and seasoned in your account um, for typically at least 60 days. So um, that means that if you don't have those funds in your account today um, and the source of that is, uh, th is not really something that we could normally allow if you tried to make that during the application, be aware of that. Um, the guideline calls for, again, uh, two months of bank statements uh, to show that money is sourced and seasoned in your account, in your ownership. Um, the one thing I will, I will stress relative to um, verifying those assets is when you're looking at your bank statements, um, I typically would go back, uh, you know, at least again, two months bank statements. I would not try to do computer printouts from the branch. I've seen folks try to do that. And it's a, um, it's a bit of a flag. So today's May 24th. If your statement cut out um, and you're now waiting, you might have to be honest with uh, the situation that you're in. If, you, if you're trying to buy a house, you might have to extend that, that sale out so that we can get those two full statements. Um, because if those funds came from an, a disallowable source, your entire application um, will be denied. Uh, there's no way for us to, as a lender, really any lender, um, once we know something that makes the loan file um, deniable, or deny, you know, it required to be denied, the, um, there is no further recourse as a lender. We can't just turn the other way. It doesn't work that way. So that's why we try to train um, you on what the guidelines are so that you can make educated decisions with regards to what your, um, how your application comes in and when your application comes in. So when you're, um, when you're on a second home or an invest, excuse me, or an owner occupied property, um, you can get gifts, right, depending on the source, uh, but those funds still have to be seasoned. So this has also come up sometimes, um, a little bit less rare, but if you receive a gift from um, a relative or um, a partner of yours uh, in your life, um, typically it needs to be an immediate family member, which means parent, grandparent, son, daughter, things like that. Um, less, less uh, able to be approved as something like a cousin or uh, even a friend. Um, you can actually, uh, we had a situation recently where the money was coming from an LLC that was owned by the spouse of the borrower. A little bit really specific, but interesting uh, use case. And because the LLC, which had the money, was a, a single owner LLC and the single owner was the borrower's spouse, we were actually able to use that money um, for, uh, for down payment. So 
Um, so that was pretty cool. That was an interesting situation. Um, so again, it was it was a uh, it was an opportunity. It was an owner occupied transaction. Um, it was an opportunity to use that money as a gift where they might not otherwise have been able to use it. So it's always good to explore um, to explore that uh, when it comes to LTV and assets. For those that are just showing up, um, we're this basic open Q and A for today. Um, the agenda was we were going over uh, market conditions and explaining rates, which is what you're probably seeing on screen right now. And uh, if you had any questions about how the markets were moving or opinions about what might be happening, an explanation behind why you know what those opinions could be, and we can talk about that. And we also have uh, loan programs um, on deck. If you have any questions about what kind of programs could be possible for a scenario you're looking at, um, we can talk about that too. And feel free to take yourself off mute or to put it in the chat window and I'll be glad to address it. Um, I think another thing that, that's happening right now with, um, with folks that are being pre-approved um, is the, um, the use of using a hard credit pull versus a soft credit pull. So if you've ever seen, um, uh, you know, online or, you know, if you've ever gotten something in the mail or whatever in your email, it's like, hey, check to see if you qualify for this, this credit um, without affecting your credit score. That's called a soft pull. And a soft pull is something that used to be fairly infrequent. Um, you might use it for um, like a job. Right. There are some some employers use soft pulls just to check um, if you are actually who you say you are. Um, soft pulls are also used in identity identity verification. So if you ever had to go on a website and um, and they ask you questions like what was the make and model of the car or which address have you lived at? That's it. Those are actual versions of soft pulls from the three bureaus. And so one of the things, one of the initiatives I'm working on with, with Ridge Lending, because about half of the applications that we get um, every week are for um, what we call uh, to be determined transactions, so TBD properties. And uh, there is very little reason to have your credit hit with a hard pull unless you know almost with certainty that you're going to use that credit a report in connection with a loan application within 60 days of of um, within 60 days of that credit pull. So the um, the idea is that the idea is that um, we want to make sure we're saving your hard inquiry for when it's actually needed. So one of the things that we're working on is when you do. Uh, apply at Ridge, if it is for a TBD transaction, um, we're going to um, want to make sure that we're qualifying you appropriately for that pre-approval. And one of those things is if you're planning on uh, working with an agent or you're planning on working with a turnkey, we're going to need to get a pre-approval letter over. And so that means if you're actually sending out a, um, uh, you know, you want to send out offers to purchase property and you want Ridge Lending to help you with that financing, we've got to make sure we've got, you know, your best interests in mind and making sure we qualify you properly. A lot of times that has to do with running a credit report, um, but it ends up being a kind of dicey situation if you're just not even sure. Um, so what we're, you know, what I'm working on with our, our, our dedicated lending specialist teams is making sure that um, you're aware of when you want, you know, are you actively working with agents? Are you actively working with turnkeys to find properties? And do you really want to hustle to try and get a property purchase, you know, or at least go under contract in the next 60 days? And that's important so that, again, when it comes time to find that property, A, we can get that pre-approval letter over to match your, your offer. Um, and then B, we can make sure that you're not, um, you're not negatively hitting your credit report over and over and over again as you're trying to... Um, re you know re update your your pre-approval status so those are you know that's an important part of of the experience that i want to share with everybody on the call today is making sure that you know when we when we go through and you're working with ridge or you're working with anybody in lending um it's always healthy to make sure that your credit report's only being run when it's appropriate 
And uh, we have other ways of getting this information. The soft pull is, is one of those. And we wanna make sure that uh, you've got all the resources available to you um, as you need them. And uh, you know, that's, that's it on that. Does anybody have any questions about credit? I know we've gone over the credit report, Chael, you did a whole thing on credit report. So I'm not gonna kill you with that again. But um, while we're meeting here, anything on credit or getting pre-approved or understanding how that works. Okay. Uh, last thing I wanna cover on, on my agenda at least was, was um, making sure that everybody understands how to calculate debt to income. And this gets extremely complicated when you own properties. So uh, normally debt to income simply means um, the amount of your monthly debt divided by the amount of your gross income. And um, sometimes I'll say the word taxable income, um, but that's not always a good descriptor depending on your situation. And I'll, and I'll give you an example. <clears throat> if you're W-2 employee, you can say, and that's your only source of income, um, or if you have a uh, basic uh, income that is uh, consistent and is, uh, does not fluctuate and has your, your federal and your state, if you have a state tax, but your federal and other taxes withheld from that payment to you um, every time you're paid. That's a very simple mathematical formula. You look at the gross, Neely, thanks for your question. I'll get that one second. Um, you'll, you'll take the gross before taxes and you'll use that for qualifying. Now, if you have uh, something that is a non-taxable income, um, there is, uh, when, we, when we look at that, there are some types of income we can actually gross up. Um, so some pensions, some, uh, social, uh, some social programs, uh, like social security, things like that. Uh, you can actually gross up and use a larger number for qualifying. And uh, where it gets complicated here is if you have any type of rental income or you have self-employment income, there are portions of your tax return that we can actually add back into your, um, to your income. So these are, these are considered to be paper losses for IRS purposes but they're not real cash outlays when it comes to mortgage qualifying. So depletion is one example. Depreciation is another example. Um, you also have situations of one-time extra extraordinary uh, expenditures that you also might be able to add back in for qualifying. So sometimes we might ask you for, your, for no income documentation based upon your employment or sources of income. Um, and other times you might actually um, request and require you to send in your full tax returns um, before we get that pre-approval out or before we move you into processing, because we want to make sure you're not wasting your time or wasting your money uh, before you, you move forward. So um, when we get into that debt to income uh, qualifying, it's important to understand the, the source of that information. Um, the last part is going back, if you've got real estate that you own, it's, uh, there's also a distinction, Shelly's gone over this before too, it's a distinction between um, if, you've, if you're, you're still in, in the year that you've purchased the property or if uh, that property is outside of its acquisition year. And what are we looking at in terms of on, on the tax returns and what are we uh, looking at in terms of lease income? Um, so it can go from the very, very simple of if you know, you're somebody who, works and you get paid um, a basic salary or you get paid an hourly rate or you get paid commission. Um, regardless, that's all standard taxable income and it's a, it's a fairly straightforward calculation. Um, but it's very important to understand that um, when you look at your tax return, the, the taxable income on a tax return isn't necessarily what's used for qualifying. So if you have any situations on that and you want to get a better understanding of what you could qualify for, um, that's that's why uh, Ridge is around. So you can either call um, 855-74-RIDGE or email anything over info at ridgelendinggroup.com and um, we'll figure that out. We can get a handle around, um, you know, what your debt to income ratio looks like and, and what 
you could be eligible to qualify for. So uh, Neely asks, does pre-approval for investor loans have a typical timeline before expiring? I've only ever dealt with primary. Yeah, so welcome to investment. <laughs> Welcome to investor financing. Uh, there's no difference. Neely, a pre-approval is a pre-approval is a pre-approval. Um, the part that is harder um, when you're dealing with real estate investing, of course, is the timing, right? So um, to earlier today, uh, we turned a borrower in for pre-approval and uh, their goal is to buy something this year. What does that mean, right? What does that mean for them? What does that mean for us? Um, what it means for me personally is that's an example of why I don't necessarily want that borrower's credit report run, right? If, if their credit report is, is uh, anything today, but uh, they don't actually find a place to put an offer in on until July or August, it's, it's a wasted run. It's a wasted credit report run. And I don't, uh, I don't think that that's really appropriate personally. Um, so we're doing something about it um, with the soft pull. But the, to answer your question, I think you're asking is any pre-approval is only good based upon the information that's evaluated at that time. So credit reports have to be, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, the loan that you close, uh, the credit report that's included in that loan cannot be more than 120 days old at the time of closing. So usually that's your, your biggest piece. But um, another way to look at it is if you gave me a bank statement, let's say I didn't run your credit report and you gave me a bank and we did a soft pull today and you gave me a bank statement from uh, March. Um, those are only good for 60 days in uh, any, any mortgage credit file. Does that mean your pre-approval is expiring? Um, yeah, technically, but the reality is, I don't really, um, I don't really believe a a pre-approval is meaningful um, until you find the property. Knowing what you qualify for is is very very important. So um, what we do is a two-step, Neely. Um, you know, we'll go through and evaluate you. Today's May twenty-fourth, so evaluate you May twenty-fourth, and then we try to figure out, okay. What do you, who are you working with to find property? When are you trying to close? And then we update that information or let you know as we go along, like, uh, like Neely, are you close to finding a property? Do we want to update your assets? Do we want to update your income? Um, maybe you filed an extension for 21 and on May you didn't actually file the return yet, but then come August, you do file the return. Everybody's different, right? Um, or um, what if you sell one of your properties uh, in, the, in that time? It was on your application in May, but now it's no longer in your application in August. What does that do to your qualification? So it's always important to, to touch base um, on that. Uh, I hope I answered your question. I hope I answered your question. Awesome, awesome. Um, that's another thing on the pre-approval. Neely, now you got me thinking about this. It's another thing that we're doing differently at Ridge. Uh, we used to do like these blank check pre-approval letters. Literally, it said to whom it may concern. Um, I don't find that very valuable. And as a seller, I actually wouldn't even accept that. Um, I don't know if anybody else has ever had that experience as a seller, but I want to know that letter was drafted on or near the offer with the agent that was presenting the offer at the terms matching the offer. Like that's what I really care about as a, uh, as a seller. And so that's one of the changes, the, the um, procedural changes that we've made at Ridge is to make sure that when you need a pre-approval letter, we issue it to an agent um, for that amount to match your offer. So it's very, very clear to the seller that you have actually um, had your information um, reviewed by a mortgage lender who's experienced in closing those kinds of loans as quickly as possible. Um, so that, that's, that's an important takeaway. So thanks, Neely, for getting me to say that. Um, Donna, which type of income is better in qualifying? Uh, I'm sorry, I've actually never been asked this question, like ever, in 30 years. So all income is good. Any income is great. Uh, but as far as better, there is no such comparison. Um, income is income is income. Um, if your question is more of 
which kind of employee is better for a loan? Is that really your question? In other words, is it more complicated to qualify if you're W-2 versus if you're 1099? Is that your question? Because it can't be about money because money is money. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to pretend that's your question. Um, yes, that, that's my question. I'm, okay. I'm, I have an opportunity. I'm retired and I have an opportunity to, um, you know, work as a consultant. Yep. Um, and, um, I'm being asked every time that, you know, someone approaches me about being in, you know, a, a emergent level literacy person for their school or their whatnot. They always ask me what type of, how do you want to be paid? 1099 or W-2? And I'm thinking, huh, uh, that's a good question. I have never had anybody ask me that before. Okay. So I always say, I'll take my money in a brown paper bag. Thank you. Um, <laughs> But so this is this is uh, a couple different perspectives. Um, a as an employee, I always want to be paid W two if it's going to be the same amount of money, because on a ten ninety nine you're paying both employee and employer taxes on that money, and that's not fair to you. So if I was going to pay you fifty thousand dollars a year or whatever for you to come work for me, and I'm allowed to pay you ten ninety nine. And you accept that? That's easy. That's great. I'd love that because A, you're not an employee, if that's really true. Um, B, I don't have to pay taxes on that money. Um, on top of the money I pay you, I just pay you your money. Um, and then C, if you do anything you know, weird, I can just cut you off because you're 1099. You're just an independent contractor. Now, <clears throat> every state has a, def a definition of what independent contractor means, especially for your industry. Um, I don't know what teacher, you know, how this relates to your profession, but I would say my, um, so my answer for you personally is if I can get paid the same amount of money both ways, I'm always going W2, always. Um, that's just life lesson for me. Um, when it comes to qualifying for a mortgage, remember 1099 is going to have to be filed in your Schedule C, right? Um, even if you don't have a business, it's still put on your Schedule C of your 1040. If you decide to not have any expenses against that 1099, your accountant would yell at you, first of all, because you're an independent contractor and you, you are allowed to you know, document expenses that the IRS allows you to reduce the taxable income from that 1099. And that's what people typically do. People, people typically take the 1099 to reduce your taxable income because somehow they get, yeah, they got 50,000 and they put it in the bank. Then they figured out what their expenses were and they paid, they got the 50 grand, but they only paid taxes on something less than 50. And that's fine. But when it comes to qualifying for a mortgage, you're only going to be able to count the net income from that 1099 after expenses. So if you like put your car against it, because you were using your car in the business to get, and your accountant's like, yeah, that's fine. And let's say your car is $15,000 for the year. I'm just, you got a really fancy car um, with gas and whatever else. And so we're only gonna be able to use $35,000 if that's your only expense, we're only gonna be able to use $35,000 for the, for the um, qualifying income, not 50. And then, the real downside is if you've been doing that less than two years, we're not going to be able to count it at all. Versus if it was W-2, I could count you right away from day one. So the answer is it depends. It's my favorite answer. Because I get to, you know, I get to ask you more questions. So that's um, it's a really good question. And uh, again, I'm, I'm in a, I'm in a space where you can't really justify independent employment because I have to work in a specific place of employment. I have to use specific software. I have to be specifically licensed. You know, so I can't really be an independent contractor, um, which is it's for our industry, for the mortgage industry, it's 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 been a good move. It's been a good move. You can only work for one employer at a time. So, you know, you can't be an independent if you. I'm telling you what to do and where you have to be. You're not really independent. It's a great question. Thank you, Donna. 
any other questions coming up? I think that's all I really had for today. Um, hope everybody has a uh, safe Memorial Day weekend. Uh, hopefully you have a chance to spend it with family, et cetera. Uh, thank you for coming, Donna and Neely. Thank you for your question. And Jose and LQ and Michelle. Hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Thanks as always. And please let us know if we can help you out here at Ridge Learning Group. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, Larry. Thank you, Michelle.